Welcome inside episode 581 of the Locked On Senators podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba, alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains. And today we finish our trio of projections of Senators restricted free agents with a young franchise, Eric Brandstrom. And we've got two very interesting prospects on our prospect profile countdown. A Russian with a lot of question marks and one of the best defensemen in the CHL. A Manitoba kid. Both high ceiling prospects. So let's get into all that and more. This is the Locked On Senators podcast. Your team every day. Locked On Senators. Your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Every day. Thank you for making Locked On Senators your first listen. On this Wednesday, June 15th, we are free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube, where the best way you can help the show grow is to click the subscribe button, like the video with the thumbs up below, and leave a comment as well. Today, we want to know your projected contract for Eric Branstrom. This one certainly won't break the bank, even close to the last two guys we did. Where do you even begin with Eric Branstrom, Pilsy? Ross, for me, this one is the most interesting of the three we've done because I think for Joseph and Formanton, you kind of have an idea of where they are in their careers. You kind of have an idea. Okay, we talked about Formanton being a great third line winger. We talked about Joseph getting a small sample size in the top six, playing really well with Brady and Josh Norris. Okay, you've got spots for those guys. But where in the world does Eric Branstrom fit into this Ottawa Senators organization? It's so tough to tell. And similar to Formanton Ross, he is an RFA without arbitration uh, rights. So the Senators, they hold the power here once again. And I wouldn't be surprised if they use it. And if you're Eric Branstrom, you're probably at a point where you're like, well... I don't think I necessarily showed my best yet, so I'm not going to go push for a big contract here either. Let's just kind of turn the page and I'm going to work towards getting a better deal next time is probably where Brandstrom and his new agent, right? He switched agencies, so that's probably where they're looking at right now. He's with Newport Sports. Pills, you ever heard of them before? Yep. So not only... He did set a career high, though, in points. So Zero goals, though. Yeah, zero goals, 14 assists, and he played 23 more games than he did the year before and had one more point. So the plus minus went from plus three to minus 17. However, he was thrown into a higher level of situation because of the long-term injury that Thomas Shabbat suffered in the middle of last year. And to me, he did all right. Like He didn't really take the bull by the horns. He was getting first power play time and Maybe in a watered-down situation because for most, if not all of it, Norris and Batherson were both injured as well. So it was a tough time for that first unit where, yeah, Brady's an awesome net front guy, but he's not one of the 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 top-of-the-umbrella guys who are going to help create puck movement and and stability. You still had Timmy on there, but without your No one finishes like Norris, exactly. No, exactly. You, like... No offense to Thomas Shabbat, but you know a few of those apples, you just put them on a tee for number nine and it's in the back of the net. So yep. um, with, with Branstrom, it's such an interesting situation. I agree with you when you when you say that he probably goes uh, as short a term as possible. Yeah. He still has three years to go before he – or four years because this four. is off his yes. entry-level contract still uh, until he hits his uh, unrestricted free agency. So you're not worried about that. I wouldn't even really worry about – arbitration there's not much of a case you just be like all right well yeah right now he's proven to be a depth defenseman at the national hockey league and not a whole lot more than that Pilsy. it's a, it's unfortunate but coming off his entry level where he's made 832 50 what do you think about the victor mete contract one year 1.1 million and just go from there i think they'll probably use that as a uh, kind of comparable and a base I think Brandy's probably going to command a little bit more than that. But uh, but it's hard to say that because Victor Mete already had 200 NHL games under his belt at that time and had similar production and similar values that he brings to the table. I think Brandy will probably go a little bit higher. I, I see him between 1 and 1.5 million range. And whether that's a one or a two-year deal. 1.5 would be egregious. I mean, egregious. We're talking about a couple hundred grand here. It, it wouldn't I know. be that crazy. But you got to look at the at the mints he put up, the 
the draft pedigree he has. And also the thing with Branstrom and I, he kind of gets looped into the same thing as Gustafson here. Like he's never really had a chance to put his feet in one spot and be set up for success properly. Like I know we, I know exactly what you're about to say, Ross. And yes, he did get massive opportunities with Shabbat injured, but that's not where Eric Branstrom was supposed to be. And like you said, sure, he's getting top power play time without the top power play guys. Really, honestly, Eric Branstrom was mostly playing on a second power play unit when he was quarterbacking that top power play unit. Let's let's be real here. Like, it wasn't top caliber uh, guys there for, for the most part. And he didn't he didn't ever really get full seasons in Belleville. He was up and down constantly. He had those uh that unfortunate start to training camp a couple of years ago where he uh had covid, gets there late, breaks his hand, all this kind of stuff. Like he's never really had a long runway to get things done at the right time, at the right uh kind of position for him and I think that's really deterred his development and that's been an issue for the Sens and for Eric Brandstrom. There's no way that Eric Brandstrom uh, or the Senators want to do anything more than two years here, though. Like, it's it's a one- or a two-year deal in my mind. Yeah, it has to be. And when you look at, uh, I mean, we talk about the Swedish system. He, he had a lot of that. Look at this page. As, yeah, like to scroll that far. And For a guy that's 22. Doesn't make much sense. But you're right. He even played nine games in Belleville this year. So yeah. he has been up and down. As much as as he has since coming, it's four seasons in Belleville. So yeah, Gus just hasn't beat by one. But even that to say, he doesn't have that explosive ability that you need from a guy who's under six feet tall and really can't defend that well on the best of days. There's a few times like I don't know why it always comes into my head, but just to have uh, Lucic in front of the net. And just like <laughs> the easiest tap in you've ever seen. It was like Branch was a fly on his shoulder. He's like, yeah. no, just get out of here. And a lot of defensemen are like that with Milan Lucic. He's one yeah, of the, the biggest, most intimidating players in the league. But that to say, like, it, it just highlighted how, how far he has to go in, as a defender. And not everyone's going to be an Erica Branson or like th- these big guys who are defensive defensemen. But if you're an offensive defenseman, I'd like a little more than zero goals. And maybe that's a tough comparable because you're not only looking for goals from a defenseman, but even just more creation offensively. However, there were games where you're like, all right, like he is a great passer of the puck. He always makes a good first pass, and he's very good at finding seams in the neutral zone to hit his wingers with, with speed that they can carry the puck up. Certainly a valuable commodity and something the Sens decor didn't have enough of. My curiosity goes around the fact like he has his little fan club where everyone's ready to pat him on the back whenever he makes one good play. And I'm almost curious if Sens fans who are who are of that vein, and there are lots of them, it's not like if you're listening to this that you're the only person. I wonder if it's because the rest of the Senators' decor was so bad at moving pucks outside of Shabbat the last couple of years that when you finally see a guy make a tape-to-pit tape pass, you're like, This guy's unbelievable. (laughs) We got to lock him down. He can make a pass. But I think now that you're going to see Jake Sanderson, and maybe we're setting the expectations too high for Sanderson, but he's going to be an NHL defenseman right away. There's very little doubt in my mind for that. I wonder if all of a sudden those same people are going to be like, oh, there's more than just one guy who can move the puck. Because Brandy moves pucks. We know that. But what else can he do? What else? You can't make an entire career being as one-dimensional as he's shown in the early stages of his career. That being said, I do have faith, Pilsy. I've got enough faith. I would go as high as two years, 1.25 for now. And then, you know what? You play well. You put up 30 points in, in the second of those two seasons. And we'll be talking about you in the same vein as the Formantons and the Matthew Josephs, somewhere between 2 and $3 million. But right now, you need to he needs to add more tools to the toolbox. Because right now, he moves pucks. What else does he do? Yeah, and, and that's the thing. Like, I, I think a big reason why maybe the offense has dried up a little is because he started focusing on defense a lot more. And and I thought as the year went on, he got better defensively. I'm not talking about boxing out Milan Lucic uh, no, in front of the net and stuff but, like that. But dude, how hard on that note, and sorry, I'll let you finish that, but how often does he get hammered behind the net? 
but again, I thought he got better as the year went on. He got better at uh, avoiding those checks. He was still in those positions to be hit, but he was able to kind of shift shift over and not get fully crunched anymore. Like at the start of the season, Ross, I know you'll remember this when we watched the AHL opener in Laval. Branny got absolutely demolished. Like one of the biggest hit, live hits I've ever seen. And he got crushed in the AHL. So he he realized pretty quickly he's going to have to smarten up if he's going to be playing big minutes in the NHL. And and I thought he did a good job of that. I thought he did a good job of um, getting in passing lanes in the neutral zone. Just some small things that really he wasn't doing before. He did better. And I think that kind of slowed his... Uh, his ideas to j- jump into the rush or to pinch more and all those kinds of things. So I think he he dialed things down defend, uh, offensively, sorry, so that he could ramp things up defensively. And I think it kind of worked. But again, he's never going to be that shutdown defender. So you can't fully go all the way defense and lose all your offense here. That That's a big issue. Yeah, that, no, that's very fair. But for, for me, it's just like, okay, he's 22, right? We're not... And maybe it was a fact that he was he came to Ottawa right after the World Juniors. Because, you know, you still feel like your prospects are so young when they're at the World Juniors. He had just finished his time there, then got traded to Ottawa. So he's still 19 years old. It just feels like he's been in the organization forever. Yeah, it, it really does. And that's the thing. Same with Gus. Like, he's been bounced around. And his best time, Ross, was before he came to the Senators, when he was with the Chicago Wolves. 41 games, 28 points in 2018-2019. And then... No, he was nasty the year where Belleville had their wagon when we were when we were at the games working. I think it was 20 points in 23 games he had that year with... Uh, oh, Belleville. yeah, no, that. but I'm, I'm just saying his highest point totals... Oh, for was, sure. ...was at that point because he never got any consistency. That And that year, Ross, he was killing it. He only had 27 games in the HL. Then he had to be brought up for 31 games uh, for the Sens, and he was put in positions where he wasn't set up to succeed for... Two seasons in a row. I'll even kind of throw this year in because, sure, he got the opportunities people wanted, but he wasn't quite ready for them yet. So it didn't make sense. So I I think I'm pretty similar to you. I think it's going to be the Sens are going to want two years here, I think, just to kind of just in case he has a a, a uptick this year, then they've still got one more good year because last year. We said it over and over. This is Brandy's make or break year. There's he's not going to have a two way contract this time. There's there's no way like him no. and his agent won't settle for that. Even if it's lower dollar amount, they're going to get a one way. Then you can't bring him down to the AHL like they've been doing. So that ruins that option. And Jake Sanderson's season is here. Like I think after one season of Jake Sanderson, Brandy's not going to get. He's not going to sniff top four minutes uh not this year but next year so he's gonna have to really make an imprint this year and show the sense hey there's a reason you got me i can do things that jake sanderson can't i can play a certain role he's gonna have to prove it now and and he's, he needs to be in the nhl all season like there can't be any belleville he needs to have one consistent good season here so yeah i'd probably say two-year deal i'll i'll uptick a little on you i'll probably go 1.3 all right. Well, Eric Branstrom is one year away from arbitration eligibility and four years away from being an unrestricted free agent. So I think a two year deal split the difference and just say, all right, you get we buy one of your arbitration year, give you a little more yep. sample size and then let's touch base in two years. But yeah, somewhere between one and one point three five, I'd say is probably the sweet spot for a contract with Eric Branstrom. All right, Pilsy, let's get back to our draft rankings. We've got another undersized defenseman but one with some dynamic quality coming up. But first, Pills, you got a word from one of our favorite sponsors, I do believe. Yes, it's our friends at rockauto.com. Guys, summer is here. You're going to be taking road trips, going camping. The last thing you want is for to have your car parts break down on you when you're in the middle of nowhere. You got no service. You can't get a tow truck. That's not what you want. Be prepared with Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's so hard for your local chain supply stores to stock all the parts that you need. Maybe they'll have some parts, but they won't have the specific ones you need. Why waste your time with that when you have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket on your mobile device? Save time and money when using Rock Auto, guys. Why would you spend 30, 50, or even 100% more for the same parts? Don't do it. 
Do it yourself at rockauto.com. They're a family business. They've been working for over 20 years. The prices are always reliably low for every single customer. Go explore their easy-to-use website today and find the solution for your auto parts needs. Check out rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Visit rockauto.com. All right, Pillsy. I feel like we need a jingle for that. For that amazing selection, reliably low prices. I'm so out of tune. Oh, I wanted you to finish that. I thought All I was seeing what the was... parts your car will ever need. Go to rockauto.com today and let them know we sent you. Oh my god! So, <laughs> I'm sorry for all those who sat through that. Uh, we oh, are going to get back man. to our draft rankings. We've got maybe the most polarizing player in the draft, who was Pro- at yeah, one point agreed. ranked as high as third on some lists and as low as 32nd. We've talked about big ranges, but when they start as high as three, you are really looking at a polarizing prospect. Add in the Russian factor and really just close your eyes, grab the dart and throw it at a wall, and that's where he's going to get drafted. That's how how much we know. But coming in at number 16 on our Locked On Senators 2022 draft rankings from Mother Russia, Ivan Maroshnichenko. Ivan Maroshnichenko. That's going to be one that uh, I will probably butcher, and I apologize if my pronunciation changes throughout this segment, but I'm going with uh, Maroshnichenko. That's How about we go Miro? Miro. <laughs> Miro. All right. Ivan Miro. And yeah, th- this guy, there's, there's so many different things to look at here. I, I think... Ross, it, it, it sucks to start with this, but I think we need to start off with uh, with probably the biggest thing about him. Yes, he was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma yes. in March. So his season came to an abrupt end after 31 games playing in the VHL, which is the equivalent of the American Hockey League in Russia. And obviously super sad news. He had to go through uh, radiation treatment. It's the same cancer that Mario Lemieux had during his playing career. And really touching story that Mario actually reached out to Miro and they were able to have a conversation. And I'm sure that was a a little bit of fuel to the fire uh, that Miro knew that he would be able to beat this. And the the happy ending to this so far is that he has been, um, he's completed his tests or his, uh, not tests, sorry, what am I saying? The uh, treatment. The chemo, yeah, the treatment. And uh, he has been cleared to return to play hockey we aren't sure how much if any time initially they thought he was going to miss all of next season so this is how we're going to look at him as a prospect as a player who missed time with injury because it seems like there is an inherent risk with this however as you saw with Mario Lemia you can live a full happy healthy life this is not a death sentence by any stretch of the imagination so we are obviously hoping for the best of health for Ivan Moroshnashenko, when he's on, he's an electric talent. And we're hoping that he comes over sooner rather than later. We'll let you know why he almost came over but wasn't able to this past season before the diagnosis. But let's get to his bio. He's a left winger, right shot, as they do in Russia. They always play their off wings, open up that one-timer. He's six foot one, 185 pounds. He's played 31 games with Omsky Krylia. So that's the VHL team. The MHL team is where Gleb Trikazov plays. So they're not teammates, but they do play in the same umbrella organization. He had 10 goals, 6 assists, so 16 points in 31 games, only 6 penalty minutes. And the draft rankings are all over the place. So Bob McKenzie right now has him 6th on his list. Now Bob McKenzie's list came out in February, so just before the diagnosis that he had Hodgkin's lymphoma. Craig Button, same thing, came out as 13. All the other ones were ranked after that. We had Corey Prodman at 12, although Prodman did have him at 3 on his midterms. Then Chris Peters at 20. Elite Prospects at 21. Tony Ferrari had him out of his top 32. And Scott Wheeler had him at 28. So all that averages to 18.33. Pillsy, when you look at Miro, what's the number one strength you see in his game? His number one strength is his shot. I, I think that's very apparent. And uh, 
just watching some highlights on him, he's the kind of player that knows he has a great shot and relies on it and kind of uses it selfishly, but properly. You know what I mean? Like it's it's like Josh Norris on the power play. Like sure, once in a while, his teammates are probably like, ah, like it'd be nice if I got uh, a power play uh, shot opportunity here. But if Josh Norris is going to score every time, I'm not going to be upset with him. And that's kind of what's, uh, what's going on with Miro here because – He's the kind of guy, and you know I love this, he just brings the puck into the zone and just rips a shot from from the hash marks. And more often than not, it's a goal. And if it's not a goal, it's a really good scoring opportunity and hopefully a rebound to create chaos in the offensive zone. And he's the classic Russian, too. He sets up in the left circle and just is teed up for one-timers on the power play. Like, it's very obvious what type of player he is. He's a heavy shot, offensive-minded guy. He also kills guys. Like, yeah, it, very much. Like I don't want to say he's Alexander Ovechkin. I literally, I was gonna say a very poor man's Alex Ovechkin. They they play a similar type game. Is he gonna get to that level? No, no but uh, they do play that same game where it's like I'll score on you and then knock you on your ass before I finish my uh, goal celebration here. And he, he's got the the frame for it too. I've got him at six foot one, hundred and ninety pounds. So he's definitely got some size to him. And he's a powerful skater as well. Like this, like just a classic Russian machine type of player that he has good, strong strides and he doesn't slow down or he doesn't lose any intensity when he gets the puck. In fact, I would say he ramps things up a little when he has the puck and he's skating with it on his stick because he knows there's an opportunity for him to get uh, in a good range for scoring. It doesn't take long, just cross the blue line, he can rip one. And he can deke through guys as well. Like his hands aren't like his top thing, but he, he just offensively with the puck, like he's going to, where there's a will, there's a way, and he's going to find a way to beat you to get a good shot. So we can basically call him the Siberian Alex Ovechkin. <laughs> yes, yes. His little town is crazy where, where it is. I mean, just shows you how overly enormous Russia is. Like they need any more territory. That's a story for another day. But he, his, he basically lives like an hour from China and an hour from Mongolia. Like they are oh, in wow. the far, far, far east. Very close to uh, Vladivostok is the port city that's that's very close to there. But... Yeah, he hits like a truck, he can skate like the wind, and he's got an unbelievable shot. Now, even the scouts that were lower on him, though, before any um, any long-term health implications came into play, it was consistency, and it was kind of all the tools, no toolbox. Like, maybe not the, the most high hockey IQ brain uh, on the planet. Like, not getting in lanes defensively, not, you know, being in the right spot, not knowing where his teammates are going to be to make the next play. But the raw tools on this guy are unbelievable. And that's why if it weren't for the Russian factor, if it weren't for the cancer scare, I'm just, we're just going to call it scare because it seems like it's in, it's, it's in a good place right now. Very happy to see that he's going to be able to get back on the ice sooner rather than later. But this guy would have gone top 15. Somebody would have jumped up and taken him. Now I worry it's a case where Tampa is going to get him with the last pick in the first round and he'll be in the NHL in two years. Yeah, definitely he's a home run type uh, type swing of a selection in the draft here. And yeah, like like we just highlighted, all of those things that make certain Russian players so good, the heavy shot, heavy hitting, strong body, strong skating, typically that comes with the same downsides is very lackluster defensively, kind of just hanging out. Like he's, he's the type of guy when you're playing men's hockey, like he takes like two minute shifts and is just hanging out waiting for the puck to be loose. And then he just turns things up offensively and he's nowhere to be seen defensively. And you know, that's okay sometimes when you're justifying it by scoring a lot of goals, but eventually it gets old and coaches aren't going to like that. And he's going to, that's going to be needed to co be coached out because he just takes shifts off sometimes is what, uh, is what some of the, the scouts say. And, I think draft wise, yeah, this the team that's going to be looking at him is someone that's like, okay, we don't have a big prospect pipeline here. We're trying to capitalize on a guy that could be in an entry level contract situation for a couple of years. Let's take a swing on him and hope that the health concerns are no longer an issue. Let's hope that the visa can be sorted out because, yeah, it's been not just once, Ross, it's been multiple times that he's been denied access to uh, the U.S. and, from my understanding, Canada as well. So there's uh, there's been some tricky things there. So there's some obstacles for Miro, that's for sure.
I just think once you get drafted by an NHL team, they've got their lawyers and they'll get someone over. I don't think it's going to be as much of an issue as it would be to come to the USHL, which he Definitely. meant to do the last two seasons. He was almost denied access to the world under 18s. Yeah. Thank God they let him in. What, he scored six goals in seven games. He was an absolute unit captain for Team Russia. Now, Russia won't be at any international events, so you won't be seeing him on that stage anytime soon. But this guy, like all the raw tools are there, and he's been the captain at every level growing up. Uh, Corey Pronman, who's going to be a guest coming up on this show, he, not today's show, but coming up in the next couple of weeks, um, he, he has player comparables. And like we always say, we're using his because – you know what? Don't shoot the messenger. But he sees him as a Gabriel Landis cog type, like same type of power forward. I think he's probably got a bit better of a shot than Landis cog. But in terms of the compete level and the uh, and the the physicality to his game, I think it's an okay comparable. Maybe not. I like the Siberian Ovechkin. Sounds a little, sounds a little better, right? Um, Ovi's the Moscow guy. He's got all the flash and and the clubbing. You know, all the nightlife, but. Miro's the Siberian version of that. Just big, strong, but can absolutely hammer puck. So I've got him at two stars for Ottawa, though. I, I just don't see it as a fit. This is a team that I, I understand the Sens probably need to swing it a little more home run-esque in the draft, but I don't see this as the guy. I think that we know that they haven't drafted a player out of Russia since 2005. 2005, right? Igor was playing yeah, in Cape wow. Breton, so it doesn't count. He's the only rush in that they drafted since then as well. Now we know it's a new era, but I still don't think with the, everything going on in the world that this of all years is going to be the year where it's like, oh no, let's let's go. And now is the Russia. time. <laughs> so I got, yeah. two, I got two stars for Maroshashenko. That's fair. And and I definitely see that. I, uh, I went a little higher, Ross. I got him at three and a half stars just because I think like the Senators are at a point where they've stockpiled their prospects and their pipeline is so full that... Like, what's the point now of just getting more safe prospects? Like, obviously, you should you should get some safe prospects. That's not what I'm saying. But, like, if you're going to take a home run swing, you should try to do it when you're loaded with other guys that you think have safe uh, projections to make the NHL. And this is a kind of draft where a top-tier talent could fall to them. Like, it wouldn't be the craziest thing if if he's in their range for the first second round selection. like Oh yeah. I think he's going to be gone between 25 and 35 is kind of my range for him. That's what I'm saying. So like he could be available right around yeah. there. And if they're deciding, Hey, let's try to take a swing on things. Let's try to capitalize on a guy. Lane Hudson. <laughs> yeah. Let's try to capitalize <laughs> on a guy with uh, a lot of uh, big raw tools here. And that, oh. As long as things go well, that uh, he could be a part of this team and we could get him over here. I think it's something that could make sense. Now, do I think the Sens are going to do that? Absolutely not. But I think I could see a fit. And if you're looking at a home run type swing, this is the guy. Before we get back to our countdown, just a quick word from our friends at betonline.net. More props, odds, and lines than ever before. Go to betonline.net. They've got you covered with all the information, the sports scores, the podcast, the news, everything you need to make money this season. It's not just one sport. It's all sports and fun props as well. You can bet on where the next coach is going to land. We had two coaches get hired in the National Hockey League. One plus probable with John Tortorella. Going to Philadelphia after Kevin Weeks threw out the video there. So all these information, all this information, you can use it to your advantage, and you can find it at BetOnline.net. Just head to the website today, or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. It's BetOnline.net where the game starts. All right, Pilsy. Before we get back to the countdown, am I hearing breaking news? We have breaking news, Ross, and of course, we're talking about RFAs and guys that uh, the Sens could sign, and they do not go the direction that we were hoping and thinking they would go, but we do have some Sens news, finally, I'm so fired up. Sens communication, tweets, news release, Sens sign forward Dylan Gambrell to a one-year contract extension. Let's go. The contract has a value of $950,000 for the 2022-2023 season. Dylan Gambrell is back. Dylan Gambrell is 25 years old, and he played in 63 games last season, had three goals and four assists, was put into a defensive-minded situation for most of the season the quote from Pierre Dorian here is Dylan's versatility is one of his greatest strengths 
He quickly earned the trust of our coaching staff as an effective penalty killer who could be relied upon in any situation from the center position. So one of five senators to record a shorthanded goal this past season. Is this kind of a 13th forward type thing? I mean, you had him. Does this mean less chance of Adam Gaudet coming back? Where do you stand with all this? I like this. And when we talked about RFAs, I know you were a little down on him and you said any guy that's only getting three goals in however many games is not really worth it. And and that's fair. But look, they basically, they got him at an entry-level contract. He's a guy with good NHL experience. He's a guy DJ Smith trusts big time. He... There's there's a lot of value to being a defensive center that when you're on a young rebuilding team, you can just trust him. Like you're not like, okay, can Gambrell get what I need him to do done? Like every time you throw him over the boards, you know you're going to get exactly what you need from him. And maybe that's a little underwhelming, I'll admit. But I, I thought he did a great job defensively. And I think he's the perfect guy to – you want to create competition. And he's the perfect guy to say, hey, Mark Kaslick. You want that fourth line uh, center position? You got to beat out Dylan Gambrell for that. And you got to work for it. It's not just going to be there for you. And he's the perfect guy to have as a 13th forward to pop in and out of the lineup here and there when you need him. So I really like this. And we were worried because he was at 1.1 million last year, Ross. And we were like, well, you can't really pay him more than this. So for him to go from 1.1 mil down to 950, it's a no brainer in my idea to bring him back. Shows me that he wants to be here as well, right? Because yep. he's an RFA. He could have just taken his qualifying offer if he got one. Maybe the Sens were like, hey, look, we're offering you 950 or we're just not going to qualify you. And then you're on your own. Maybe that was the situation here. You know what? Credit to them if that's what they did. They used their leverage in the right way there. And they got him at under a million dollars. Do I expect him to be in the lineup every game next year? No, not. but yeah. I love the way that you uh, framed it there. You're not just giving Castlick the job. But if Kaslik outplays Gambrell, it's a one-year deal for a guy who's 25 years old. You get a little bit more uh, of a veteran presence when you have Gambrell around the guys. And if Norris needs a helmet in a a (laughs) last-second situation, you know where to go. He's he's the guy for that. So Dylan Gambrell signing a one-year contract at $950,000. Let us know in the comments as well what you think of that contract and what you think it means as a domino effect for a guy like Adam Goddett. Pilsy, the irony that we do three RFA projections. come on. And right after we do the third, another one signed. So, hey, stick taps. This is going to be good for Dylan Gambrell as well. I think that it's a good fit for him in Ottawa. We know that um, he's never going to be an offensive juggernaut, but you gave up a seventh round pick, a pretty low level asset to get him. And now you're getting probably a hundred NHL games, which you would have probably not gotten out of a seventh round pick. And it also adds that level of competition good value for for what you're getting you're getting good value all right back to the nhl draft rankings right here on locked on senators coming in i can't believe we are already this far in the countdown coming in at number 15 from the moose jaw warriors defenseman denton matechuk Denton Matechuk, one of the one of the best uh, defensemen in the CHL this year, and definitely one of the best in the WHLs. He put up massive points, Ross, and this is one of those guys that um, the WHL he got a couple tastes before, like he got his kind of uh, obligatory seven games that uh, you see a lot of guys get a couple years ago. Then he got sixteen games in the bubble, but with some consistency and a little more size uh, to him. This year, he really popped off. In 65 games, he had 13 goals and 51 assists. Good for 64 points. Basically, a point-per-game performance. And then, in the playoffs, he kept on going. In 10 games, he had one goal, nine assists. Good for 10 points. And uh, before he ran into your Winnipeg Ice, Ross, he was lighting it up. He had... Sorry, just got to scroll down. He had eight points in five games in round one. And then the ice kind of froze his point production there and uh, he wasn't able to keep things going. But I think Denton Matejchuk, there's a lot to like here and scouts agree. Yes, 100%. Now the only question mark, uh, we'll wait for the question mark. Let's stick with his strength. This guy is a dynamic skater. Absolutely love watching him weave up with the puck. He was a high riser as well. I don't think that he got enough credit at the start of the season. He was like a, a late first round projected player, but he played number one minutes 
for Moose Jaw this past season. He was representing Canada at the World Under 18s, which was great exposure for him. His skating is the number one a tribute, right? Like there's nothing more that you can say rather than just like watching him skate is, is a treat. And I think that it's going to allow him to play in the NHL at under six feet tall. Now he's going to be over 200 pounds. He's pushing that right now at 194, but the points pop 64 in 65 games. We just did Connor Geeky who had 70 points as a friggin' top line forward. Yeah. So now you're looking at a situation where this defenseman is absolutely in the mix. Elite prospects loves him. <laughs> Eighth overall on their list. Oh, did I just talk about his skating? <laughs> then you've got Scott Wheeler and Corey Pronman at 13th each. Hey, Chris Peters as well. So that's three guys having him 13th. Then Craig Button has him 22nd. Tony Ferrari has him 24th. And yeah, Bob McKenzie, the oldest of all these lists, has him at 29th. So I'd expect that number to rise. This is a player... I believe will be gone in the top 15. I don't see how he sneaks past being the third, if not fourth defenseman off the board. We know the two Eastern Europeans with Juracek and Nemich. And then you're looking at Matejchuk and Korczynski from Vancouver in the WHL as likely the next two guys off the board. And I think it's going to be a classic handcuff situation, right? Like if Korczynski goes... The next team is probably going right. to look at drafting Denton Matejchuk. So I, I agree with you. He's probably going to go within the first 15 picks here. And for good reason. Like the, the you mentioned the skating. That's a big deal. Ross, I can't believe you didn't start off with he's a Winnipeg native. Ooh. You got to love that. And um, yeah, the skating is really apparent that that's his skill because he's great in the rush offensively when his team has the puck. And he's great at breaking up plays when the other team is coming back in transition. And he's able to kind of keep up with forwards and um, he's able to have pace. But the issue is, and where you see that uh, he really relies on his skating, is when the puck gets into the D zone and the Warriors are trapped in their own D zone, he really struggles. Like he's not able to use that skating as a skill. He's not able to kind of pick up the plays and read things properly. And I, I'm surprised, Ross, a lot of scouts said um, he just doesn't have a lot of strength when he's defending in his own zone, which is surprising for a guy that is up at almost 200 pounds here. So that's something he's going to have to work on. But when you're a guy putting up 64 points, it's okay if you have a couple defensive flaws in your own end. Yeah, no question about that. And also being a July birthday, Pilsy, he's a guy who I think is just going to get better and better and explode. This guy, to me, is going to be a lock for the World Junior Team yeah. next year. Now, I don't know about the summer one in, in August, excuse me, but... That's going to be such a weird one. Wow. It's going to be so weird. I don't know if I'm ready for it. Anyways, that's neither here nor there. It would have been great if it was right before the draft. And yeah, then like, have like it kind of seems push. a bit of a waste here. Yeah, well... With Matejchuk, I don't think he needs that to really show what he's already proven. You mentioned the points in round one were absolutely astounding. He only had one game with points against Winnipeg. Yeah. It was a quick series, only five games. He had two assists in the finale of that series. But he's an offensive weapon. He was feeling it earlier this year. He had a six-assist game against <laughs> Regina. Oh, oh, my God. They won 10-4. He had six apples. What does he do the next night? Goes out and puts up a goal and three assists. So 10 points in a two-game stretch six as a apples. defenseman. Wow. Now, will he be able to pull this off at the pro level? Probably not. But at the same time, it's so exciting, and the skill set is so elite that somebody's going to jump. And you mentioned, like, maybe he's not the strongest, but he still tries to, to tee people up. Like he's always yep. looking to make a hit at the right time. And I think that once he adds a bit of strength, if he can get himself up to, let's say, yeah, 5'11", 210, 215, he's going to be a tough player to move in front of the net, even at his size. And we said this about Lane Hudson. We're going to say this about a lot of the smaller defensemen. It's not like they just became small yesterday. They've had to defend as a smaller player pretty much their whole life. Yeah, they're bigger, faster, stronger at the NHL level, but I, I just think that if you're able to get under guys' sticks and, and lift at the right time and just play smarter rather than more physical, I think he's going to be all right. So I wouldn't I wouldn't have a problem. Seven's a little rich, but if you trade back even a little bit, I would have him as a four-star guy here uh, where you're looking at 15 to 20 is probably where I'd like to see him go off the board. Yeah, and the thing with Matejchuk is I wouldn't even classify him as a, as a small defenseman. Like, he's no. just... A little bit below average. Right. Right. Like, he, he, we're not talking about Eric Branstrom here. He's, he's 5'11. Like, that's, we talk about this all the time, Ross. If there's a six in front of that instead of a five, 
if there's a one inch difference, we're we're not having this discussion. And he's almost two hundred pounds. So yeah, ver- verbal meme where it's Muggsy Bogues walking next to Shaq and Muggsy Bogues, who's <laughs> like five eleven, is five eleven and Shaq's six feet. It's like the one inch. How girls see men. Yeah, honestly, yeah, that's or that's how NHL insane. scouts see see hockey players. Yeah, exactly. And and that's like he plays big minutes for Moose Jaw. Uh, I think once in a while he he makes risky decisions that aren't going to fly in the pros. But again, when you're putting up almost a point per game, you can forgive him sometimes. And I really think he has the tools to be on a second pair and he can be the offensive defenseman on a second pair. You know what I mean? Like he can be your points guy with a shutdown guy paired along with them. I think he's going to go somewhere in the teens. I, I don't. I don't see how the Sens can get him. Like it's it's going to be very interesting. And I'm of the mind, Ross, that the Sens with their first selection, the seventh overall, or if they end up uh, moving back, who knows? They should be targeting a forward because there uh, is a plethora of great defensemen available in the second round, and all you have to do is pick whichever one falls to you. So I'm not really interested in taking a defenseman in the first round just because I think it makes more sense to target the the forward. So I I got him at three stars just because I don't see where the Sens are going to take him, and I really think they should be looking for a forward in this range. Yeah, as we mentioned, July 12th birthday, played for the Southern Steelers Minor Hockey Association in Winnipeg, and also fun, his cousin, Owen Pickering, we already profiled, is a guy who's expected to go in the late first, early second round. This guy, I don't know if he's still playing defense when he's playing minor hockey, but 61 points in 36 games sounds fun wherever you're playing. Yeah, that's a good time. Yeah. So we'll see where he ends up going off the board, but this is more of a long-term investment. I don't see him jumping in the NHL in the next couple of years, but when he does, keep your eyes out for Denton Matejcha. All right, Pilsy, nice to get a little breaking news on today's LOSP. So that was good stuff. Dylan Gambrell has signed a one-year contract. Not much of a gamble by the Ottawa Senators, in my opinion. It's just a nice little depth piece. Yeah, I have no issues with this at all. I kind of anticipated this would happen. It was just how many, what's the difference of a couple hundred thousand dollars going to make here? And yeah, I think this is a great play. And if you're DJ Smith, you're probably stoked about this. Like this is, this is his Tom Pyatt to Guy Boucher. Like this is one of his guys, right? So I I think it just makes a lot of sense all around. And uh, I'm stoked Gambrell's back. That's a fantastic analogy. We'll end off with that. Thanks so much for making us your first listen of the day. Give us a follow on Twitter at Send Central. Make sure you're hammering hashtag Alfie to the hall. Yes. We're going to have Craig Medaglia, who spearheaded this, this uh, program, we'll call it, this push for the Hall of Fame for Daniel Alfredson. This rally. Rally. The, oh, the Spetzer rally. Let's hope it goes better than that <laughs> at Parliament Hill. But... That to say, Craig Medaglia will join us on tomorrow's show. We'll go over that with him, get back to our countdown. Should I give another teaser? Hmm, how do I do this? A pair of defensemen tomorrow. That's how we're going to tease this. And a pair. Ross, I have uh, I have an R- another RFA that maybe we've overlooked here that we can cover in tomorrow's show. So stay tuned for that. Oh, all right. I can't wait to find out who. All that coming up on tomorrow's LOSB. For today, we say goodbye. For Brandon Piller, I'm Ross Levitan. This has been the Locked On Senators podcast, your team every day. <laughs>